Good morning, everyone. I'm so, so honored to be here with all of you. And I wanted to thank you for all your beautiful expressions last night. It was so profound. Yeah, so thank you. And I'm going to open up with one song, and it's called Awaken You. Wait. 
Hmm. Thank you, Stava. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Great to see you. Oh, just wonderful to look look on the screen and see your faces. Uh, yeah. During the instructions there, I saw Lilo on one screen giving instructions and then Lilo smiling on another and I said, there's superposition, there's two Lilos on my screen today. <laughs> so, it's beautiful. The face of Christ is everywhere, everywhere. Well, we're going to have a beautiful session today because uh, I could just feel all of your hearts uh, watching the session last night and all the, the stillness and the love and the, and the openness and the transparency. Uh, these are all things that are so key to healing because if we're going to wake up to the Christ self that we are, we, we have to be very open and we have to be very, very transparent. And I just loved all the witnesses of the transparency of sharing the, the prayers of the heart, the, the vulnerabilities, the doubts, uh, the anger at, at God, all of the expressions, the full range of expressions that are part of the the human condition of believing in the ego. So we're really learning really a deep lesson right now that if we're going to experience the face of Christ, if we're going to experience a new perception of this world, something that's beyond the veil of the ego's mask and the, we want to be have that veil lifted so we can experience this face of Christ experience, then we really have to be willing to expose everything. I remember when I was reading the Course, there would be certain lines that would jump out at me. And um, one of the ones that really jumped out at me was that this Course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden or it will jeopardize your learning. So Francis last night was talking about this new thought system we're opening to, learning this new thought system, learning to think with God, learning to think in alignment with Holy Spirit, uh, alignment with Christ, and really releasing all scraps of, of thoughts and beliefs in the ego because that's the way we come to see the face of Christ. And I know as I was reading through all your questions, you know, you've, a lot of you wrote in a lot of questions. Um, it was almost like a Don Workman there in uh, Colorado, you almost uh, wrote a little diary entry. It was so beautiful. But it, was, it showed me your steadfastness at really practicing this, like you really have been going at this since the 1990s and, and giving your heart over to this and, and just deepening and deepening. And that's a good witness for all of us uh, because it takes a steadfast devotion, it takes a steadfast purpose uh, to really keep the fire bright, you know, to keep the flame going through many, many, many experiences. And I wanted to just thank you too for writing that out. and expressing that to us. And to me, when I look at, at this spiritual awakening, what I start to really realize is that it helps to have a little bit of a context because for most of us, uh, we perceive ourselves, we have perceived ourselves very much as, as in the world, uh, even though we were, we were told to practice being in the world but not of it, most of us have had a very strong dose of conditioning around being in the world. And what does that even mean? It means uh, reacting and responding to forces that seem to be external to our mind, uh, economic forces, forces of uh, personalities, um, situations, reacting and responding to situations, 
and learning skills and abilities to deal with, uh, we could call it survival on planet Earth. You know, that's the baseline. And um, Tim Reagan wrote some beautiful things in uh, a few days ago and also uh, today, but Tim was talking about the, the ladder of, it's like a prayer of unwinding. It's, the, it's like a, 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 a ladder of uh, being unwound from the ego and, and awakening to God. And basically, he basically was saying at one point that all of us are either ready to wake up to reality or we're preparing to be ready to wake up to reality. Or the third category was those who don't really have a clue that there's an option to wake up to reality. <laughs> he put those three categories in there. And he said, but we're all really in this together. That's like the continuum of of beings. There are those that don't really know any more than the physical world that seems to be presented to them and and so they don't really know that there's an option, uh, that there's a wake-up option that needs to be activated in the mind. Uh, that maybe they've just learned how to respond and survive and as Francis said, everyone who comes to this world or seems to come has a belief system and operates from that belief system and organizes their perceptual world based on that belief system. And those categories that Tim was describing of not really knowing that there's an option to wake up to reality or not even having a sense that there is a reality, just feeling like, well, it's a dog eat dog world and I have to survive another day and handle a huge range of problems and then tomorrow I get a whole new set, and then the next day a whole new set. And then there are those that have been really working on the spiritual journey seemingly with great dedication and devotion, and they're on to it. You know, they're kind of uh, on to the idea that there is an escape that's possible, and that it does involve releasing uh, darkness, exposing and releasing darkness, releasing judgments, um, it involves developing trust and letting your skills and abilities be used in miraculous ways by the Holy Spirit so that your skills get developed more and more and more. And Jesus even tells us in the Course that, that your skills can be developed to such an extent that they can help you escape from an impossible situation. So it's kind of funny to think of it, but He's basically saying this perceptual world of fragmentation and darkness that you perceive is an impossible situation. It's, it, it could not happen. God doesn't even know about it. It's, it's an impossible situation, but he's so practical. You know, then he says, but you can develop your skills and abilities to an extent that you can escape from an impossible situation. And that's what Francis referred to last night as, as reinterpretation. All we're really asking for, all we're really receiving guidance for and instruction is, is how to allow the Holy Spirit to reinterpret this dream from a dream of, of sadness and pain and suffering and conflict, competition, isolation, guilt, shame, fear, doubt. Reinterpret that into what Jesus calls the real world or the happy dream, which if you want my definition of what a happy dream is, it's just a dream in which you have nothing but happy thoughts. Not one doubt thought crosses your mind. Not one scrap of fear remains in your holy mind. You still perceive the world of images, but, but the, you have happy thoughts in your mind in the sense that that you have no judgment, no comparison, no discrimination, nothing else going on but those happy thoughts. And that's why it's called the happy dream. <laughs> you might say, you, how do you get to a happy dream is through happy thoughts because Jesus tells us our, the world we perceive is just a reflection of the, the thoughts and the emotions and the beliefs that we hold in our mind. So if we empty our mind of those egoic thoughts and beliefs and, and feelings, then what we're left with is, 
is happiness and that's what the happy dream is about, the real world, true perception. So to approach that, it takes a desire, it takes a willingness to not hide and protect any thoughts, any of these mostly unconscious thoughts that rise up into awareness, to not hide them and protect them from the Holy Spirit. Now, there's been so many beautiful questions uh, written in and we got to hear from Patrice last night and um, it was so beautiful because, um, yeah, we met Patrice in Sedona and I've had some communications. I'm glad we got the, your microphone working, uh, Patrice, and, and I'm glad you were able to share last night because I can feel you're really getting into the depth of this and just giving yourself over to it and some things are popping up, uh, which that's what happens. But when you wrote in your question too, uh, the written question that I had from you, you were really asking about desire, like um, you've been working the instrument for peace and the, the levels of mind and, and you know, you start to go down from the perceptual level to the emotions and then to the thoughts and down through the beliefs and then to the desire and, you know, using Spiri, using the instrument for peace, the different things. What you do, as you were saying in your question, it works every time I'm able to work the process, which is what you were asking for. That's really the process. You've been doing the process, so that's beautiful. You're, you're right in the middle of working the process. And you were saying it works uh, because it brings your mind to peace. But your main question was, but my goal is enlightenment. You know, I, I love the momentary peace as I go from from being upset to peaceful, but uh, I really want enlightenment. I really want the, the full experience of, of who I am. And then you were asking the question, can, we, can you talk a little bit more about desire? Because that's at the core of the levels of mind. That's our point of power. That's our point of prayer. Uh, many times I've even said desire and prayer are synonymous. They're actually the same. So the prayer of your heart and your desire, they're the same. And so ultimately it's like an altar in the center of your mind. And what's on that altar gets radiated uh, and reflected in throughout the mind and also in the perceptual world, whatever is on that altar. So it's not so much a question of whether God answers prayers because that altar is just pure love and light, but it's like the question is more of what do I have on my altar? You know, it's when people say uh, be careful what you ask for because you might get it. It's, it's even more than might. <laughs> Whatever you ask for, you get. Whatever you give, you receive. Like Francis was sharing last night, giving and receiving are the same. So then you start to realize that altar, that desire of the heart is so important because that's where the purification really occurs. There's a beautiful line in A Course in Miracles that I use with those levels of mind and the line from Jesus is, and this is, I just think this is one of the most profound teachings ever, but Jesus says in the Course, truth will we be returned to your awareness by your desire as it was lost by your desire for something else. That says a lot. I mean, that if we just took that one line from the Course and instead of 31 chapters and 365 lessons and a manual for teachers, we want to keep it as simple. Truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire as it was lost, truth was lost, by your desire for something else. In other words, in heaven, desire is just, you might say, just the song of prayer. It's just a song of happiness and gratitude. And having been a singer in this lifetime, you can maybe relate to the idea of song. Of, of heaven is just a continuous song of gratitude of thanks from creation and creator. Uh, it's just a dance, it's a song. Uh, there's nothing else. That's all heaven is. 
It, it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's reality. So if we talk about this world, you know, if we use a psychology or a psychiatric term, psychosis is called a break from reality. We would say that the human condition is, is a perception that's a break from reality. It's a break from that song of gratitude. It's a, that song of gratitude has been so denied and pushed out of awareness that even when we experience glimpses and bursts of happiness and bursts of peace and joy, we know there's so much more to it. Like we're just getting the tiniest glimpse. And, and I sense that from the different talks. Uh, I just want to go home. I heard that repeated over and over. Uh, I think it was um, Karina uh, up there in, in Canada. I just want to go home. I just want the feeling of home. That's all I want. That's all I pray for. Like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you know, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Like E.T. in uh, Spielberg's uh, movie, I just phone home. He, he wanted to phone home. Even an extra, extraterrestrial on Earth was just praying, it just wants to go home. And a group of kids that, that like relate to that, they want to go home too. And they want to help him go home. And all of us are here together because we want to age and assist each other. We're, it's like a choir. We want to learn to sing that song of gratitude and sing it every day. Uh, down here in Mexico, when I, when I wake up in the morning sometimes and I watch the light, the, the light starts, the sun starts to come in and the light starts to come, as soon as there's light, in this terms of the, even perceiving it in the world, looking over the lake and the light, the birds start flying and singing. It, I'm looking out like in a holograph, hologram of, of a bird sanctuary, but it's not just a, a motion picture, there's a lot of song. They sing and sing and sing and sing and sing and sing. They're just so happy. They're so happy to be in the light, you know. They're just singing a song of gratitude and they just sing and sing and sing. It's a great witness for me. It's a great reminder every day. Uh, you know, instead of waking up and turning on the news, I just look out the window. And I, even if the, the glass doors are shut, they're so loud I can hear birds all around me singing and flying and doing dive bombs and hummingbirds and all different colors of birds flying, putting on this great show, aerial show and, and singing show, and that's a great power. It's a powerful witness. Now if we come back to desire, then if truth will be returned to my awareness by my desire, I have to really start to take that into heart. He's not saying truth will be returned to you by your intelligence, or truth will be returned to you by your skills and abilities. He's not saying truth will be returned to you by your material possessions, or how many friends you have, or, or what your social status is. He's, he's, he's saying truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire. And so, I've said this before, I think I said this on the last online retreat, that prayer is the medium of miracles. So I could say desire is the medium of miracles. That miracles come into your mind and come through you uh, to free your mind, as the, uh, like in the Matrix, free your mind, Morpheus was saying, through your desire. So you, you have to want it. You know, I think of that famous song, if you want it, here it is, come and get it. You know, it's like that's what the Holy Spirit is singing to us. That's what the, Jesus is singing to us. Here it is, come and get it. And it's, it's saying, you have this power in you, you need to tap into it. Now, when we say prayer, sometimes people think of words, or sometimes they think of um, mantras or they think of repetitions, but those aren't really the fullness of prayer. Prayer is the desire of your heart. I mean, God knows the prayer of your heart before you even utter a single word. It's so intimate. It's like the gateway back to God. And so, um, I would say it's more 
like I said earlier, it's like, what is on my altar? What am I desiring? What do I want? In a world where there seems to be so many different things, so many different choices, so many different options and experiences, this idea of prayer and desire is like slicing through that complexity and saying, no, it's actually very simple. You have to look at that altar. You have to dare to go inside your mind and look upon that altar. And Jesus says the ego doesn't want you to look upon that altar. He's saying because the ego is saying if you go deep in your mind to that altar, the ego is saying God will strike you blind. God will punish you. Some of those different ideas we've had, we've been taught through our our belief system of um, fear and retribution and punishment and all this craziness, dualistic ideas. But actually, Jesus is saying, no, come with me. I've got the light and we'll go down to that altar and you'll see that there's only love and there's only innocence and there's only light down there. Underneath this unconscious belief system of fear and, and doubt and darkness, there is light. Uh, Greg was talking about that uh, last night too, where he was saying just every day facing that fear of love. Even though the ego might say we're afraid of things in the projected world, that's just a smokescreen, that's just a distracted device. We're afraid of love. And most of us have faced that in relationships where you start to feel so loving and so good and so intimate that then the ego is flushed up with all of its unworthiness or its doubt, like, oh, am I worthy of this? Can I, can I receive this? Can I stay in this love? Or the ego's coming in like, watch it, watch it, you're going to blow it, you're going you're gonna to spoil it, you're going to ruin it. It always does that even in our, our interpersonal relationships and our perceptions of that, it always still is very afraid of, of that connection, that intimacy, that, that deep love. So I'm glad you asked that question about desire because I feel like that is cutting down to the core of, of what Francis was talking about last night, that there's just two thought systems and the only way that we can have one dispelled, have the darkness dispelled, is by desiring the light, by desiring to think like God by desiring to know that there's another way than, than our history would demonstrate. I feel honored and I feel like, like I'm brought toward the light through a series of experiences that I experienced in my life. So I want to talk about a, a TV show that we, uh, our community watches a lot. We know we're, we're watching these episodes of a, a show on CBS actually, CBS All Access. It's called God Friended Me. I don't know if you've seen any God Friended Me, but you know, season one was basically these, these three characters learning to be truly helpful and having these miraculous synchronicities and these miraculous, seemingly arranged encounters that would come and give them opportunities to be truly helpful, to learn how to, to be helpful for each other and for whoever received the f Facebook friend request from the God account. For some of you who haven't seen the series yet, it's quite, quite an interesting device. And then I was just thinking yesterday, I was thinking, my gosh, I watched that show, God Friended Me, with a big smile on my face, and I think, that's been the last 30 years of my life. I've, I've been stuck not in a, a season or an episode, I've been stuck in like three decades of God Friended Me, where every single day, a new day opens up with an opportunity for me to be helpful, to be useful, little by little, bit by bit, providing me opportunities to teach what I would learn, to be truly helpful, and to just show up and, and every day just say, okay, brand new day, what is it, how can I be of service? 
how can I be useful in the plan of awakening? How can I serve you, Holy Spirit? How can I serve you, Jesus? Uh, it was beautiful because uh, a few days ago I saw a, that an amazing singer just passed away. Uh, probably out there where you are in Los Angeles because Bill Withers, you know, is, oh my gosh, I just grew up listening to all these uh, Bill Withers songs um, and I recently saw him in a documentary and then he passed away I think on the 30th of March and then as I'm last night and this morning as I'm getting ready to come and do this uh, session there's Bill. Bill's in my mind as loud as ever you know. Uh, you just keep on using me until you use me up. Do -do 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 And I'm like Bill Bill, 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 it's so great to hear you. You're right here with me as we're talking about the face of Christ because everything is in our mind. Everything without an exception is in our mind. That's why this beautiful visitation from Bill uh, reminding us to all be in purpose, to give our lives over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit to use so fully so brightly, so much as an extension of love, that you can honestly just say to Jesus, you just keep on using me until you use me up. And, and that me is, until the little me is, <laughs> is used up, is washed away, is shined away in the light of Christ, until there's only Christ remaining. And that, to me, is what the joy of all of this is about. You know, it feels good to be truly helpful. It feels good to extend love. It feels good to, to feel joy in your heart and radiate that joy every day, every moment of every day. This God friended me, now they're in season two and it's starting to get a little, it's a, getting a little more ex, uh, intense because season one there were so many synchronicities and there was so many like, mind-blowing experiences of just with that little willingness to be truly helpful, these beautiful, joyful, sometimes even tearfully joyful miracles come to bless everyone and everything. And now in season two it's starting to, it's like they're getting down into the deeper recesses of, of the darkness, of the mind. It's starting to get more intense. That's the way it went in my life, you know, it, at first, you know, you make a discovery of this whole spiritual journey, you're, you're excited, you're enthusiastic, and then for me, I was going to be asked to like travel the world, but first travel the country and, and speak and be spoken through and all these things that were pretty terrifying to the ego, but it was more like Jesus was like, yeah, I know, I know, I know how frightened you are and I, I know you don't have a lot of trust yet, but you're just at the very beginning, so just I'm just going to give you some knock your socks off miracle experiences at the beginning here, just to get you boosted and going in the right direction. And, and that's what it was. I mean, when I got out on the open road with Jesus, David character didn't like to travel. Jesus has got me on the road, like on a, in a new destination every day. And it, it basically went on for, for the better part of five years. It took me on the road for five years. Knock your socks off miracles. I mean the kind that were actually important, that really set my mind in the right direction and gave me a devotion to spiritual awakening. I had to have my socks knocked off uh, I had to have a whole new redirection to my life in order to move in the direction of, of spiritual awakening, of having the entire world reinterpreted in my perception. And I was thinking too also what was kind of the shows that I watched um, during those years. What was I, what was I watching? Oh, I was watching another CBS show called Touched by an Angel. Some of you might remember the three angels, you know, uh, the, the three angels, primary angels and all the adventures of, of Monica and Tessa and the angel of death and those, those three and, and others. But um, 
that was helpful for me because I guess watching Touched by an Angel was just a witness of, of how to be truly helpful. I mean, they were constantly thrown episode after episode, just like in God Friended Me, into these situations where people were struggling. They're fearful, they're doubtful, and the angels themselves are wondering, how are we going to do this? You know, the angels don't have the answers even. They, they're in touch by an angel. They're just throwing themselves out there with willingness to be shown the power of, of God, to be shown the miracle. And so the angels are experiencing week after week, miracle after miracle. That was important witnessing for me because it just started to open my mind to this idea that the purpose of life was not just survival of the body. The purpose of life was not just, um, you know, have, have a house and have a relationship and, and have children and have pets and achieve and accomplish and accumulate and help, uh, help, s s help your country amass a greater uh, gross national product. I mean, all these crazy things that, you know, we take for granted is what the world is all about, but, but we start to realize, no, our hearts have to be open to another way of seeing. We're not seeing correctly at all. We're seeing with distorted perception. We need to really have our heart open. We need to have the blinders taken off of, of, of our eyes. But more so, we have to start to realize the power of the mind. Like you, I grew up thinking there were powerful people and powerful countries and people with money had power and there was military power and there was personal power and self-esteem power and I didn't realize that I was totally mistaken about all of that, that the only power there is is the power of God and the power of mind. That the power of mind is what needs to be recognized. These are all just projected ego pseudo powers. These are fake news. These are, are false things. None of them are real. Not any one of those things I've just listed have any reality or validity whatsoever. So even nowadays when people come and they say, did you meet so and so? They're such a powerful person. Something inside of me just laughs and laughs and laughs at the idea of a powerful person. Because I'm so aware of the power of the mind. And I'm so aware that, that the only way that we wake up to our divine love and light, to the abstract love and light of heaven, is we have to first regain an appreciation for the power of, of the mind. First of all, I went through a series of lessons with Jesus when I was really praying to know Jesus, let me see the face of Christ, let me know the Father's will, was Jesus was like, okay, step one is you have to start to realize that as you do these workbook lessons, the thing that you're perceiving, the things of this world that you're perceiving, the only way you're capable of even perceiving them is through the power of the mind. That roll of toilet paper is in your mind. That person over there that you're looking at is in your mind. That mountain's in your mind. That cloud is in your mind. That star is in your mind. The moon, the sun. It was like he was constantly working on, on he's like, you've got to take back in awareness the power of your mind. You're dreaming a dream, but you wouldn't even be able to perceive this dream if it wasn't for the power of your mind. And you have to realize that your thoughts are extremely powerful because God created your mind, so anything that you put in that mind, anything that is in that mind that God gave you is, is going to, to be so, so very powerful that, that you don't really understand how powerful your mind is. In fact, the ego made up this whole dream world, this whole cosmos of time and space, to keep you mindless. You know how like in, in like Zen Buddhism it's talking about mindfulness, be mindful, be aware of your mind, be, a, be aware of the power of your mind and your thoughts. 
the ego made the whole cosmos so that you would be asleep and mindless. That you would so much forget your mind that you would take on the appearance of a body and then more than the appearance, you would believe that the body was your reality, that the perceptual world of time and space was your reality. You would forget that you're dreaming, you would forget the power of your mind and the power of thought. And if you see my diagram called the levels of mind, you start to realize that the the cosmos, the perceptual world, is just the outside ring of, of those rings. And underneath the perceptual ring is the, is the emotional ring. And underneath the emotional ring is the, the cognition, the, the realm of thought. And underneath the realm of thought is the realm of the rings of belief. And what's underneath beliefs? What could be underneath the belief? The, the, the power of belief is the power of desire. You can desire to retain beliefs or you can desire to relinquish, release beliefs. So what I was talking about with Patrice earlier, that's why desire, the wanting, the power of prayer, all that is so very important because that's the core. That's the core of it all. And that's really what spiritual devotion is about. It's about minding your mind and, and really watching what's on my altar, what is on my altar. Because whatever I hold on my altar, I will experience. When Jesus said, let thine, let thine eye be single, he was again pointing to coming to purity of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. They shall behold in spirit the Creator, for those of pure heart. But that purification is not something that a lot of us have been trained in. You know, we don't go, we don't usually get purification of the heart training from our parents. We don't usually get purification of our heart from our education. And even when we get into spirituality, there can be all kinds of things about what to, the do's and the don'ts. And do these rituals, avoid these rituals. Do these things, avoid these things. Wait, wait, wait. What about desire? What about the altar within? What about that? That's where the purification has to occur. It's not in this thing or that thing. It's not in, in this dream or that dream. It's actually in the purification because everything that you perceive starts with that altar. In other words, if you perceive sickness in the world, far underneath the, the emotions, the fear, far underneath the thoughts of fear, far underneath the belief in the ego, there is a desire for something other than love, a desire for something other than God. If you traced the perception of sickness, which is a false perception, but if you took it down deeper and deeper, 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 deeper still in your mind, you would have to come back to, wow, I can't even perceive it unless I want it. So what Jesus is really saying, this is the message this morning that he, I'm delivering for Jesus is that whatever you perceive, you do want it. You do want it. Whatever is bothering you, whatever is disturbing you, whatever is, is causing you a sense of turmoil or conflict, you want the, the, the depth of the teaching, it's that you do want it. So, what, where does that leave us? Where does that take us? Is Jesus is saying, the first thing you need to really do in authentic spiritual awakening is you need to start to honor the power of your wanting. If you, if you keep pushing that power of the wanting out of, out of mind, oh, then it's easy to play victim. Oh, then it's easy to play I'm at the mercy of something outside of me. But 
but you would have first to deny the power of your wanting before you could play those games of the ego. In fact, Jesus applies this even to the ego itself. He says, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel the ego by withdrawing your belief from it. Isn't that powerful? He's not saying fight the ego, he's not saying destroy the ego, he's saying you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. But what are you going to need to dispel the ego? The power of your wanting, the power of your prayer, the power of your mind to say, I have done this thing, or I believed in this ego, and now I would undo it, now I would dispel it. You've got the power all along. That's what Glenda the Good Witch told Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> you always had the power to go home. You always had the power to go home. We've always had the power. I'm looking there at Lilo over there in Belgium. You know, you wrote a beautiful prayer in Lilo. You said, I just find myself wanting to talk about Jesus all the time. I, uh, Jesus and miracles, that's, that's it. That's it. I've just got a one-track mind now. I find myself just wanting to talk about Jesus. And then you said, when I'm sitting there and I begin, I, I'm talking to my family and I'm sharing all my, my miracle talk and my Jesus talk, the, the, then those around me sometimes go silent. <laughs> They probably are giving you that look, just that look, silent look, you know, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> here she goes again. <laughs> but, but actually, that's a wonderful thing, because if, if miracles and Jesus and, and the joy is coming from your desire, your prayer, then that's where the transformation is occurring, and that's part of letting, having to let go of whatever interpretations from the past that you're giving to those appearances. You know, are they, are they nodding their heads? Are they, they're, they're completely silent. Are they breaking eye contact? You know, the typical things that we've dealt with for years, those deep beliefs about social interaction, you know, Basically, those are all up now and are being part of a purification process. I remember I used to, to ask Jesus all these questions, like I would just talk to Jesus about all kinds of topics. I would say, one time I said, what about friends? What about friends? You know, like the, the TV show Friends, or just friends and friendship. And uh, one time I was asking him about friends, like, He'd say, well, it's important to be friendly. But friends, that's another matter. And I'd say, what? What's, what's, and he said, friendly is, a, is an attitude, it's a beatitude. It's always important to be friendly. That's, that's what God's will, God is friendly. Uh, but, but friends, it's another thing. So one time he guided me to uh, Lesson 76 in the workbook. I am under no laws but God's, and he started rattling off all these laws of medicine, uh, you really believe you would starve unless you had stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal disc, you really believe that a, f a fluid pushed into your blood through a, a tiny sharpened needle will ward off disease. I mean, it gets very specific in there, and there's a couple lessons where He's really talking uh, about, I'm under no laws but God's, and that kind of is a play off of Lesson 50, I am sustained by the love of God. But anyway, in Lesson 76, he says, you believe in the laws of friendship. And I'm like, wait a minute, why are you talking about friendship? You were just talking about needles and medicine and, and money, and now you're talking about friendship in the same lesson that you're talking about, uh, I am under no laws but God's, and now you're telling me, are you telling me that friendship is, 
is part of my ego belief system. I'm almost like, you've got to be kidding me. And he's like, yeah, actually, it's important. Your attitude and your extension and your prayer is everything, but, but you have so many false concepts that even your laws of friendship and family can, can hang you up and can, can freeze your mind and lock you down into people-pleasing, into expectations. Of course, those are the things that are part of the purification that's, that's occurring. So, for me that was important because I started to realize, wow, I need to really be faithful to prayer and I really need to, to let the Spirit guide me in all things. And that means that whatever my eyes are showing me, that it's coming from an interpretation in my mind and I need to learn to let the Holy Spirit be my only interpretation or my only interpreter. I need to hear one voice and have one interpreter for all images of time and space if I'm going to know God's will and be happy. So that was important. That was very important for me. I remember another one, a being that I really admired a lot was Paramahansa Yogananda and so I really started to look up some of the things that Paramahansa Yogananda had to say about friendship. And basically, what I found was basically, friends are only helpful for you if they're part of your devotion to God. I was like, oh my gosh, that, that's a pretty high calling. You're going to be doing a lot of weeding in my friend garden in there. <laughs> Holy Spirit, if you're telling me that, that the only friends that are helpful are those that are joined and are reflections of your devotion to God, I was like, whoa, Paramahansa, that's, you're going right at the jugular of, of even friendships. Because I had a friend, uh, Nicole, from Australia that wrote to me recently and she was asking me about that where she said, I always seem to be I'm in my joy, but then I'm always feeling like I have to be on call for all of my friends, to do all these things for my friends, and, and feeling this tension and stress and anxiety and pressure around friends. So, I sent her a couple Paramahansa Yogananda quotes <laughs> to, as a gift uh, to, to show that it's the prayer of your heart, it's the desire of your heart to be truly helpful and we have to go through many seeming stages of purification of coming to understand what that truly helpful means. It's one thing to be helpful, but as long as we still have a lot of beliefs in our mind of what that helpfulness is, there's still going to be some undoing and some purification that goes on so that we can come to that prayer at the beginning of the Course, I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. There's a purification that's going on that takes us higher and higher. And the more we start to give our mind back to God and say, I am here only to be truly helpful, we start to feel like we're in a tractor beam of light, like we are getting beamed up, beamed up royally back into the Kingdom of Heaven from that desire to be only here to be truly helpful. So, that to me is, is really a key because whatever I perceive in the world, if there's anything that has any sense of discomfort for me, I have to come back to the power of my wanting. I have to come back to a, like an honesty of the heart and say, wow, if I'm perceiving something that, that is not joyful, that is not loving, that is not supremely happy, it's because I still want it to be true. And I have to acknowledge the power of my wanting. There's a saying that is going around now, I've even seen it on some uh, 
some Amazon advertisement for A Course in Miracles. I love that when I type in A Course in Miracles and I see Amazon.com. Everything is mined. A Course in Miracles. Like, whoa, you go Amazon. I love it. That's a great reflection to my mind to see an Amazon.com advertisement that says everything is mined. And you know what? It's actually true. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you are mind, holy mind, and purely mind. He says, if you understand that you are mind, the body and the world is gone from your self-concept. He says in another place, he says, mind reaches to itself. It does not go out. It does not go out. Those are some strong words. Mind reaches to itself. It does not go out. It contains you, you within it and it within you. The body is outside you, but it seems to surround you. Wait a minute. Everything is mind. Everything is holy mind and purely mind. So as soon as I start to say physical body, mind, as soon as I start to say something of time and space, whatever that something is, mind, even I was looking at that word, uh, Kirsten's going to start uh, on Monday doing, uh, going through her book, I Married a Mystic, and start on Monday for weekday transmissions. And, and if you go to YouTube, you can click on this little button, this little bell, and that's your reminder. Everything is a reminder. Even in the middle of the word reminder is the word mind. And again, Jesus is saying, you are mind, holy mind, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy mind. Also H-O-L-Y would work too, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy mind, purely mind. You are mind. Some of us have gone to mind, body, spirit, you know, conferences. No, no, no. He, would, he never throws those words together. Ever. Not once in A Course in Miracles will, will you know, even in, in science and the farther reaches of holistic healing, they talk about the mind-body connection. Well, there's something greater than the mind-body connection is start to realize that the mind is real and the body is not. How can you have a connection between something's real and something that's not? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you know. It's like when I used to go to Unity churches and they'd say, all is one, all is one, all is unity, all is one. I'd say, yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it, love it. And then they'd say, when you die, you go to the other side. And I'd say, wait a minute, I thought we were just talking about unity. And they'd say, you go to the other side. i say, how many sides are there? And what, <laughs> you know, is anybody ask these questions? You know, if everything is one and everything is mind, that's where the healing occurs. Healing comes from the recognition that you start to realize there is nothing outside of your mind. Your mind is, was created by God and there is nothing outside of mind. Well, ultimately this will lead to the experience that projection is impossible. Jesus tells us throughout the Course, you're either projecting or you're extending. You know, everything you think, say or do, it either extends the truth or it multiplies illusions. That's a great idea from the workbook. Everything I think and say and do either extends the truth or it multiplies illusions. Basically, he's saying you have a very powerful mind and you don't want to be giving it over to the ego to multiply illusions. Because why? Because you won't know who you are. You'll, you won't know yourself as the Christ if you're using your mind's power to multiply illusions. The healing occurs 
the face of Christ occurs when you start to realize that there's nothing outside of you, meaning your mind, not your body, not your personality self, but there is nothing outside of mind. So recently we've had this phenomenon that people are calling the Corona virus. Of course, Corona is like the, when I look up Corona, I see it's like halo. Let me see your halo, halo, halo. I'm, I'm hearing Beyonce's songs in my mind when I'm thinking of Corona. Let me see your halo, halo, halo. Let me see your halo, halo. What's the, what's the halo around the sun? What's, the sun is so bright that you can't really look at it, but, but you can when there's a solar eclipse because of the, the moon's there. And what do you still see when you look up to, at the moon during a solar eclipse? The halo, halo, halo. That corona is still there. The moon can block out the sun, but it can't block out the corona. The corona is still there. It's the reminder of the light in your mind that will never go out. It's that sparkle of light that's so bright that you can, you can try to cover it with darkness, but that halo is still there. That corona in your mind, that light cannot be blocked by the ego. Even with the moon, even with a solar eclipse, there's still light because of the corona. It's a different interpretation. See, I'm saying everything's just symbols, so I'm giving you some new corona interpretations. This is how the Holy Spirit works, giving you bright interpretations. In fact, when you start to forgive, as Jesus teaches forgiveness and mind training in the workbook, but Jesus says pretty, all, pretty, on, pretty early in the workbook that you can tell that you're, you're starting to approach true vision. And he's talking about Christ vision. We're talking about the face of Christ. He's talking about Christ vision. You can tell that you are approaching true vision when you start to see light surrounding the familiar objects that you perceive in the world. He's actually telling us in the workbook that when you start to see the corona around your brothers and sisters, I mean the light, the, the sparkly light around the figures of your brothers and sisters. You are approaching spiritual vision. You are approaching the great rays when you start to see light around individuals. It was funny, we recently, we, we, were in, we did a week-long retreat down in Chapala, Mexico uh, just last month. And, uh, you know, I was just up there sharing and shining, having a good time, you know, sharing the love and the light. And then, I don't know, we got like two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through the retreat. And then people started off with these things like, this, oh, David, we're seeing auras around you, and you turned into this, and you turned into that. And they started to see visualizations. These are all just symbols. There's, there's nothing special about any perceptions, uh, because all perceptions are, are false, and they all just give way to the light eventually. But they started to see all these perceptions of, you know, auras and, and different kind of things. But, but that was just a natural tool witness being used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit because they were getting so happy. They were getting so joyful. They were starting to have like an uncontainable, gleeful, joyful feeling in their heart. And, and that was their prayer. And then they started to see these, these symbols. And, and that that's, should be helpful. Even when I would watch Touched by an Angel, I loved it when the angel Monica, you know, She'd be with them interacting with people and then they'd be like, just to the point where like, they were looking at her like, can I really trust you? And then, ah, oh, here comes the bright angel light <laughs> right on top of Monica. And then they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's when they'd get really humble because they thought they were dealing with just a person. And then all of a sudden, 
when Monica's light would come on, I would just be all these swirly feelings in my heart watching Touched by an Angel, like, oh, here's, here she go, here comes God. And she'd say in her, her uh, Irish broke, God loves you. And I, oh, got me again, you know, in the middle of the turmoil, in the middle of the difficulties, the struggles, she hangs in there with him, hangs in there, and then just when they're ready to abandon hope, abandon faith, ah, oh, this, her red hair suddenly has golden flecks uh, on it because it's that aura, it's the corona, the corona, it's the, the Monica angel corona thing come on, and that's when people got really humble, and they would usually burst into tears, because deep down they were hoping to find a way through the conflict. And when her angel light would come on, you know, they would be, have tears of like, oh my gosh. They would suddenly get very humble. They would suddenly feel like, I'm in the presence of, of God's love, really. It's like Patrice was saying, last night, you know, she was like saying, this is real. That's the, that's the main thing I got from your, uh, your sharing, Patrice. You're like, this is really real. This is like really real. <laughs> I mean, that says it all right there. If you have all these experiences and suddenly, doing the light bulb goes off, it's like, this is real. This is, God is real and I'm, I'm on my way. I tell you, I am on my way. That's emotional. That's when I first met you in uh, in Sedona. I could see I was just talking, talking, sharing, sharing, and you were like in the back with your eyes closed, just rocking in some kind of prayer. And I was, it was so beautiful. It's only happened to me a couple times. One time I was in uh, China. I think I was in Beijing, China, and I was this room full of people, a hundred and some Chinese people, and then. I was talking and sharing all this love and light, and I looked in the back of the room, and there was a woman with, with her haircut, dark hair, and she just started, like you, she started, closed her eyes, and she was just rocking in the back of the room. And then I kept talking, talking, she was rocking, rocking, and then she started, with her eyes closed, dancing in the back of the room. <laughs> I've just given this talk to this huge audience, and I can see her. So, of course, afterwards I had to go back and meet her, like I met you in, in the grocery store and so forth. And then we came together, and before I left China that time, she just came along and we did a, a silent meditation where we just filled a whole room full of people and we just went into this deep, prayerful meditation. But it started off by me saying, well, who's that rocking in the back row, you know? Uh, because to me, that's like just a symbol of giving yourself over to the prayer, you know. You're just giving yourself over, you're trusting. Okay, God, here I come. I don't, I don't fully know how this is going to go, but day by day, moment by moment, I'm, I'm coming. This is my devotion, this is my desire. So thank you, thank you, thank you Patrice, thank you all of you for for joining in this most sacred purpose, because we are here to witness and we are here to bless. We are here to allow that prayer of our heart for awakening through forgiveness to be activated. And once it's activated, we are on the ladder of prayer. We are, we are allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us every day for the unwinding of the ego. We may have pockets of darkness that may arise, but that's all part of the reinterpretation. You know, Jesus has told us you have to bring the darkness to the light. We have to allow the unconscious darkness to come up. We need to really be there for each other to support each other during this process of spiritual awakening. That's what this symbol of online community, or live-in, co-living community, or spiritual community, all of it's the same thing, really. We're here to witness and to bless and to support. And last night, as a, again, all of you, just the ones that poured their hearts out on screen for all of us, you did it, you did that for all of us. You, you are taking us into that experience, all the way from those that expressed your love and gratitude to 
Yeah, I was thinking, Louise, toward the end you were just talking about this, this anger at God. Yeah, we've all faced that. That's really getting down to the, the nitty-gritty. That's getting down to the core of it. But what we're being shown, what I've been shown is, God did not create this world. God does not know of this world. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are, are you might say, mediators, uh, helping work with us and work with the sleeping mind in a very direct way, because the Holy Spirit is invisible, but you can see the witnesses when you follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. You can see the witnesses that the Sp Spirit is working through you. And with Jesus it's the same. You, you can see the witnesses and he seemed to be a man that existed 2,000 years ago, but he's just, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are just working so intimately with our mind to free our sleeping mind of all these egoic thoughts that block us from knowing the Creator, that block us from knowing the eternal light of truth. When I started to have some mystical experiences, you know, that started to really activate my heart. And I want to get to s some of those. Uh, Susan Jameson has written in three of her Face of Christ uh, parables, which I love, Susan, uh, because as I'm reading your Face of Christ uh, parables, I'm thinking of, of my experiences, my Face of Christ parables a long way. And they're very important, because those are like glimpses of, whoa, it's kind of like in the Matrix when Neo first goes, whoa, <laughs> you know, those are whoa experiences because I see some people writing in, uh, like Louise was writing in from, Louise White was saying, uh, I've heard it many times to see the face of Christ, don't know what that really means or really I don't know how that would look as an experience and knowing an awareness in this seeming world, but I'm open to it. So there's the prayer. Louise is offering the prayer. I'm open to it. Maybe, maybe we could go back to Susan, because Susan, you wrote in these three amazing uh, parables of of your experiences, and you, it, you even, it's so beautiful. I, I first saw them as an email that came in, and I'm just smiling with from ear to ear, because you even titled them, Parable Number One, The Face of Christ, One Spirit. Parable Number Two, The Face of Christ, 9-11, when you were in New York City on September 11, 2001, and you had this Face of Christ experience right there in the city. Uh, with the towers coming down. And then parable number three, uh, which I, I kind of called the veil lifted. That was, that was back when, uh, when you went to visit uh, this person and you just felt the love so deeply. And I just want you to maybe pick Pick one of those. I, I called them Holy Encounter, and then I called Lifting the Veil, and then there was the 9-11 experience. But maybe you can just share for Louise and for those that have actually come on here and maybe have never really had that kind of mind-opening experience that you had that certainly, like for me, it changed the trajectory of my whole my whole devotion on, on this planet, uh, or experiencing this planet, because it, it sent me on a very deep inward journey, and I know it has for you. So maybe you could just share uh, a little bit from one or two of, of those experiences for, for everybody. Sure, thank you so much. Um, my heart is beating very, very fast. Maybe even faster than when it beat it when I was in New York City on 9-11. I'll start with that one. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I said, as God would have it, I was in New York City on September 11th to celebrate a birthday and have a meeting with a good friend who lived on 40, 48th Street on the 25th floor. And we had a co-worker at the time who was working for NBC News, and he called the moment the plane hit. 
and said, turn on the television. The World Trade Center was just hit by a plane. And I'm like, what? And he said it again, turn on the TV. I was like, what is, what? So I went into the other room and I saw the top of the World Trade Center literally smoking. But I couldn't see it because there was a building right in front of us. So I had this experience that I just felt the fullness of the duality where um, half of me or one foot felt like it was in a war zone. This fear came up and I felt like I was in Armageddon, that New York City was absolutely a war zone. But on the other side, I felt heaven open. It was just an extraordinary feeling of being in the presence of God. I just felt this peace and this love. And I was so grateful for that. So I went in the other room and I called my daughter, who I could never reach, but she picked up. And then I felt guided to walk down. I was like, really? (laughs) So I walked down 25 flights of stairs, holding the hand of Christ, truly. I walked all the way down. And then when I opened the door, I saw something I've only seen a couple of times. And that is this light, this sparkly light that was connecting in my mind, the the symbol was all the hearts. So every single person was connected. There were no exceptions at all. I just saw it and I felt it. And I kind of rubbed my eyes and I thought, really? You know, I didn't know what was happening, but it wasn't going away. I just felt all this love. So the interpretation was, and I know you've said this, that love is born out of seeming tragedy, unconditional love. So I just felt that and felt that, and I felt so grateful and happy in the midst of this, you know, unbelievable crisis. And I was able to fill my car with gas and get on the um, uh, what, the West Side Highway, and I sat there for hours and was having holy encounters on the phone and people around me, you know, watching military. It was such a movie. It was military going into the city because the city had been closed. So it was just so unreal, surreal. Anyone in the city would tell you it was a surreal feeling because it really wasn't happening. But what was happening was the presence of God was being shown. So, you know, I just drove home from there and I was like, wow, that was a wow. That's beautiful, Susan. (laughs) And I think... For what seems to be going on with the world right now, I, one of your other parables really struck me was when you, you went down to meet that gentleman in the West End and yeah. you simply walked into his apartment or his place and boom, there it goes again. It was so powerful and so expansive just walking into his, his apartment and the power of that. And then actually some of the words that he was speaking to you uh, right there in the middle of that experience, actually I think has a lot of relevance to what seems to be going on with the world right now. Because he, he was speaking to you in very clear, certain terms, um, speaking to you directly from the Christ and from the light. And, and I called it, I, I wrote down lifting the, it was like a holy encounter where you just walked in a door and you were just lifted up into this spectacular holy encounter. Maybe you can just share a little bit about that too. Sure. Um, I was uh, very young living in the city and uh, I was handed a note with a phone number from a friend of mine who just felt she should give it to me. And this part I didn't write, but she said, you may not feel well before you call the number. And I was like, you know, no. But then one day I was in a dance class and uh, I felt like I was going to pass out. So I took myself to the hospital. No, I actually did. I went to the hospital for a moment and I don't know, they, they didn't do much. So I went home and I decided to call that number. And I was living on West 4th Street in the city. And... I mean, it was a miracle. I called the number and here I am on a dark, gloomy day in the city and a light just came into the way. It was like a Shirley MacLaine experience. That's how I describe it. The light came in, as you were describing, birds were singing and singing. 
And I called the number. And when I called it, I felt this energy go from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head. It was just like, shh. And whatever I was feeling, that sickness was, was just gone. And then when this person answered the phone, he was so gentle and so loving. And he said, you know, I've been waiting for you to call. And uh, one thing I didn't write was that he was able to somehow see that there was uh, seeming drug paraphernalia around me. It wasn't mine. It was someone I was living with. It was just marijuana. But he told me on the phone, you'll be wanting to move from there. So I went, okay. You know, and I, he, he actually said, do you need help? And first I said, no, no, I was so happy to talk with him. And then he said, well, then you don't, you don't. Need. I said, no, 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 I have all this darkness. I have all this and this, and I don't really want to live anymore. I, I don't want to be in this world, all this. He said, well, do you want to see me? And I said, oh, yeah. So I made an appointment for June 19th, and this is back in 76, as I mentioned. And like I said, when I walked in, when I walked into his home, I knew I wasn't on earth. That's how it felt that I was in a heavenly realm. There was so much light and so much love, and I was surrounded, surrounded by peace. And that's how it felt. And when he sat down, he helped me. He gave me some energy. And then he spoke, I'll say the way you do, (laughs) because he said, God is closer to us than our own breath. You know, he said, this whole world isn't real. He said, um, and this was a point, too, why I remembered him so vividly recently, is because he said, there's no such thing as virus. There's no such thing as germs or disease. Not at all. And he asked me if I wanted to do this mind training, which looked a little different than the course, although I had picked up the course around then, too. But we would call him if we felt we lowered our consciousness or had a dark thought. And if we didn't know what it was, he would know. So anyway, that's, but there was so much love and so much forgiveness. But he made it very, very clear. He said, you have to let go of everything. But God, he said, your mother, your father, your friends, you know, that our father in heaven is everything. And he didn't say it that way. He said it much more eloquently. (laughs) But he said, God is all. And he said, I know you know that. And in that moment, I felt like I was making a decision for life or death. You know, I couldn't go back. Even though I was a teenager, I couldn't go back. I just had to stay on that path with him. And I couldn't go back to the hospital and pick up the medication. Because he said, if you pick up the medication, then you don't have faith. So he said, it's all about faith. And I didn't, you know, have an aspirin or anything for like 25 years. It was very strict. You know, we don't have to be so strict now, but then it was like very strict. And it was kind of like, also like when he said to you on the phone, when you first called him, you need to move, which is more like a Morpheus kind of thing to say to somebody who's just calling for the first time. Like when Neo was calling Morpheus, you know, stand up and do it slowly. They're coming for you. You know, it was kind of shocking the guidance during that first phone call. But but then what happened? Uh, what did you receive in the mailbox uh, the very next day uh, after that experience? Yeah, I received a letter in my mail breaking my lease. And it, it came out of absolutely nowhere. There was no reason. We always paid our rent on time. There was no problem. But there was a letter, and I read it to my roommate, and it was like, what what is this? And I said, it came in the mail. Our lease is broken. I have to leave. And I remember calling him and saying, I don't know if you're going to believe this or how this happened, but I have a letter in my mail breaking my lease. And he said, he laughed. He said, from now on, leave all legal affairs to father, to father. He'll take care of everything. Yeah. So that's beautiful. That That's like such a, a witness again to what the Course teaches, that if you will work miracles, if you will give your mind over to Spirit for miracle working, that 
Jesus says, I will arrange time and space for you. So, so these are examples I know from your life. These were huge opening experiences and I know for myself that these huge opening experiences, there were so many of them and that they are actually a convincing. Uh, it's a convincing that those words that he told you, this world's not actually real. Um, it, he talked about the, the Heavenly Father, he, you know, from now on, you know, leave all legal matters to, to the Father. These are the kind of things that you and I were, were raised, you know, seemingly educated, uh, fully functioning human beings, although that's debatable if that's even possible. But, but what we considered ourselves, you know, is, is functional and so on and so forth. And then these huge mind experiences show us we don't have a clue. We don't have the slightest clue how deep the rabbit hole goes. We don't have a, the slightest clue about the nature of reality. That's what I received from them. And then when I had my three revelatory experiences where I, I just went completely into the great rays, when I seemed to come back it was a bit very disjunctive for the ego. Uh, it was almost like uh, it, it, it couldn't fathom that, almost like, what was that? But it, they were so convincing that I think my devotion level just climbed higher and higher, my commitment level just climbed higher and higher because I was actually having experiences that basically wiped out everything in, I had perceived as history. I had, I had no reference point from history, from anything I've heard or read or even experienced as a human being, these were very important. So I'm, I'm just so glad that you can share these for everyone because the, a lot of the prayers and the questions that have come in are from people that either A, have not really had an experience like that and they're just working the course and and staying with as much hope and as much faith as they can to carry on this quite intense work with with this book or there are people that that have have a lot of questions and curiosity but they have so much anger like it's anger at God or anger at people uh, and it seems like the more that they go through this clearing, the more it just is triggering uh, this hatred uh, that's that's in the mind, this rage that's there. And and these are things that that everyone goes through. It's not something that you can conclude anything from. You can't conclude anything from rage. But but these kind of experiences they are so valuable and helpful and I'm just so grateful that you uh, took the time actually to to write them out and send them in and that you would would share them with all of us so thank you thank you Susan thank you ah so I would I'll go through some a little bit more too here um Tim Reagan wrote in from Hawaii and basically uh he was writing a letter that I basically saw as as an answer to some other things that were basically asked. I mean, people were asking me questions on one page and then on, on another page uh, it was being answered. But basically I would say uh, what Tim was writing was basically saying, I think it was uh, Didier from um, from France. Maybe we can We can bring that up on the screen. I think it was Didier, D-I-D-I-E-R. I don't know the exact pronunciation. There you are. Hi there. How do you pronounce your name? Uh, my name is Didier. Didier. Yes. Well, beautiful, because I was just reading what you had written, and thank you so much for for sharing everything that you've been going through and and experiences you've been having uh, and and dealing with. And then 
when I came to your prayer, it was very touching. And you wrote, my main conscious motivation in joining this retreat is to find relief from fear, to feel safe, to have faith that I will be okay in the forthcoming weeks. I notice how much my stress is associated with the notion of choice. Like, can I know if I should take antibiotics again or not? Should I try to get an earlier appointment with the specialist or should I rather delay it to minimize the risk of virus infection? And I hear how stress-free it is for you to get that connection to the divine, to receive guidance and to live in faith that Jesus will take care of everything as you follow the guidance in trust. It seems so much out of reach to me. I miss guidance and I miss the faith and trust required to follow it, should I receive it. I long for it, and at the same time, I am also afraid of letting go of control, however illusory it may be. So, I think your prayer is the prayer of, of many that have tuned in this weekend. It's, it's a prayer for safety, and, and you have an awareness that that safety is connected to the guidance, like that you really are praying for a connection with that guidance. You see the direct connection between that feeling of connection and safety, the absence of fear, the transcendence of fear with the guidance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And when I was reading your prayer, I, that's when I, I was reminded of what uh, Tim had written in from Hawaii. Because Tim wrote, Dear David, because learning to listen and follow is so integral to learning to forgive, I thought I might share with you an exercise I found to be very helpful. And I, I'm going to share this now because you were saying that there's a lot of intensity tied up with guidance, but also with, with uh, choice. Like, you want to make the most helpful decisions for yourself right now. And I feel like I could read from what you were sharing was you're putting a bit of pressure on your mind around these questions that are coming up because you miss guidance, you want that guidance, but you also have a fear of loss of control. And you, yet you see the, the helpfulness and the value of that guidance. So I think the exercise that Tim shared is actually an answer to your prayer. I, I find that when I go through all these questions, oh, yeah, DJ's question is, oh, Tim's, Tim's exercise is the answer to your question. And what he did was, he said, at one point in my climb up the ladder of forgiveness, the Holy Spirit coached me to use a coin flip to make as many decisions as possible. Now, if some of you are listening, you're like, what? <laughs> a coin flip. <laughs> but remember, all things work together for good. They're, they're, nothing is at random. Your, tra your, your tra adventures, your journey through time and space is not at random. You cannot help but be at the right place at the right time. And even coin flips, which seem to have ideas connected with chance and luck and 50% and all these different things, if given over to the Holy Spirit, can actually be used as devices to get deeper in touch with the Holy Spirit. So I thank you, Tim, for writing this because this exercise is showing how a coin flip can actually even be used for connecting with the Holy Spirit. I've actually done this too, Tim, but I'll... I want to read it for you here. Uh, what He wrote, what am I going to eat for lunch? Go out? Question mark. No. Stay in? Yes. Okay. Ham sandwich? No. Omelette? No. Leftovers? Yes. 
The Holy Spirit told me to do it for a week. So, so Tim followed the guidance of the Holy Spirit to use the coin flip for making decisions. And that's beautiful, Tim, because I know a lot of people are going, would the Holy Spirit ever <laughs> do this to me? Yes, Tim did it. He ended up doing it for one year. He did it for a whole year. He did his decisions in his life, his daily decisions in his life, using a coin flip for a year. Now I know right away you're thinking, what's going on Tim, this is a bit extreme. But no, let's continue on. Tim writes, in retrospect I can see how the exercise supported the unwinding of my mind, the climb up the ladder of forgiveness, not making it real. Number one, the exercise was a pledge of allegiance of sorts. I allowed myself completely with the belief that there was another voice that although I might not be able to hear, was there. So, it's a, it's a step of faith. Okay, guidance is available, I'm not actually able to hear it consistently, but I know you're there. Here you go Holy Spirit, use this coin to reach me. And people use this with all types of things. Um, you probably have, have heard of kinesiology and, and the use of, you know, David, David, David Hawkins um, used that kinesiology. People have told me for years that they use pendulums, coin flips, all kinds of basic things to reach the Holy Spirit, to make that connection. Number two, I designated the coin toss as a communication tool with the Holy Spirit, a way for him to communicate with me. So he's giving over the coin toss as the symbolic gesture of saying this is a symbol that the Holy Spirit can use to reach me. Number three, I learned not to be concerned with the choice per se, whether it was right or wrong, but just with the practice of turning it over. So this is important too, because the power of your wanting has to be acknowledged and this is a, that was a, another act of faith, not focusing on whether the choice, you know how the ego will say, was that the guidance of the spirit or, or the ego, but just the practice of turning it over. It flushed up many ego preferences. I'm sure as you are contemplating Tim's exercise here, you can realize that you would be flushing up many ego preferences with the coin flip. Imagine, you know, you're, you're going to go for lunch, okay, you know, you know it's, it's letting the spirit really use it for undoing and unwinding the mind from those preferences. Five, the ego really attempts to make some seeming decisions so important, which makes the little self so important. This exercise put a spotlight on that dynamic. So in other words, Tim's talked a lot about not making the error real. This was a huge exercise in trusting and letting things be exposed and, and a lot of it is this ego preference to be right, the ego preferences for the world, the desire for control that uh, Didier was mentioning. And then Number six, what decisions are you willing to turn over to the coin toss? A few? Many? All of them? I could go on. Great exercise for a day, a week, or even a year. So, Didier, I want you to respond to, to, uh, to Tim's exercise in the sense that can you see the motive that he's using underneath the exercise? for developing trust in the Holy Spirit. Really that's what I feel this is about, but did that um, exercise have an impact on, on you? I can see that for me the, the motive would be really to trust that if I call on to the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will respond. And, and there is this fear that what if all of this was just my imagination and, and then the images of the consequences like 
Like if I go too late to the specialist, I have images of the future where the specialist tells me now it's too late, you should have come earlier. So there's always that fear of making, well, I would not make, yes, I would make a decision to follow. Uh, and then, and then if anyone told me you have done something wrong and here is the consequence, then, then there is the fear of uh, after to regret what uh, to regret following you. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you're saying that because, because this is really pointing out really that one of the ego's biggest tricks is first it tries to convince the mind very deeply that it's a body and then it puts great faith in, in the analysis of and protection of that self-concept of a body. So it's always quite concerned about making the right moves in, in a world, in a maze of complexity that seem to offer trillions of options and trillions of choices. And with a sense of fear, I, I don't, I fear of I don't want to make the wrong choice. I don't want to have to face the consequences of a wrong choice, like a pressure. And yet, I do sense from your prayer that you are praying and saying, I truly want to make contact with, with the Spirit in me. I want to really make contact. Because there's somewhere in your mind that, that you know that that is the most helpful and the most valuable thing. In other words, when we're in a state of fear, it's because we don't see a way out. We, we see that we're trapped. We believe that we're trapped. And we we're exceptionally concerned about making the wrong decisions because of the fear of death. Uh, like ultimately, the treatment concerns that you have about seeing the specialist or and the timing around seeing the specialist and so forth, or the risks of seeing the specialist, that you can see if you really step back from that, that there's like a, a fear of future consequences and, and the worst consequence, the ego will say, is the wor what is the worst form of sickness? I always say, what is the worst form of sickness to the ego says is death. You know, that's, that's the ultimate outcome to be avoided in a body identification, is survival. You have, to, you have to survive. And yet, with trusting the Holy Spirit, we can start to see that all of our lessons in trust and all of our lessons in, in releasing fear have to do with making contact with the Spirit and being guided even if we perceive ourselves in a maze, we need to have that guidance to take us step by step to lift us out of that maze. To lift us, like the old song, love lift us up where we belong, you know, where we truly are. We need that. And so, when we look at the fear of death, we are told, you think you're afraid of dying, but actually you're more afraid of living. You're more afraid of love you're more afraid of light because the ego has convinced you that light, love, God is the end of your individuality, the end of your specialness as a unique human being. And it's an identity confusion that's so flipped around now that what seems to be the fear of death is actually we find there's a fear of, of waking, there's a fear of, of heaven, there's a fear of, of God that's, that's still fur deep, further deep, deeper down. So I think that's, that's what we're exploring together on this retreat, is where is it that I have a fear of, of love? Because that fear of love will also transfer to my fear of guidance. If I feel like that guide is going to take away my special, unique individuality, then the ego says, yeah, don't go there. 
you better get real analytical <laughs> and, and get very horizontal with me, you know, here, come down on my horizontal level and, and I know you're, you're, you could be in a panic, but let's, let's intellectually analyze uh, which fearful consequence is better and which fearful consequence is worse. And, the, and there's just no solution, as Francis said last night, there's no solution at that level. We have to go much higher in order to feel the relief. So thank you for sharing that because right now, with what people are perceiving with world conditions, this is, this is a very practical discussion we're having because instead of worrying so much about doing the right thing, I would say come back to a place of calm and connection and prayer and remind yourself it's more important to think in peace and let the doing flow from that than it is to try to figure out the behavior choices. Because St. Augustine, a very famous theologian from over there in Europe, said, love and do what you will. You see how he, he was focusing on, on back to your state of mind, come back into alignment as best you can, come back in and then from that state of connection, you will be given the instructions. You may not hear a voice, but you will, you will feel them. You will intuitively feel, ah, that feels good, that feels right. So thank you. Thank you for doing that for all of us. Thank you for pouring your heart out. And thank you, Tim. Thank you for that beautiful exercise. But we actually will be going on um, Sunday, we will, back, we will have a little panel discussion on this, but I actually will try to, uh, to go through maybe one more question here. Mike and Lovgren from Denmark is writing in. Hi, Mike. And this is beautiful because you're sharing with Francis and I here in your question that you've been practicing, reading and practicing A Course in Miracles for half a year. And you picked it up after years. And you mentioned you met Francis in Copenhagen. And then um, now you've, you're really, this half year, you're really working with the Course. But also, with being new to the Course, you have, have certain questions coming to mind, like, I have a hard time accepting that the Earth is an illusion and the meaninglessness about relating to her are and all creations, bodies. Not taking care of nurturing, caring attitude towards her and us. Is the Earth not a living being? Are we to close the eyes to everything that is happening on earth? And you were saying, I have the relief on the one side, I don't have to do anything or think an independent thought, because the life force will guide and live through me. And yet, you're questioning the idea of the authority and responsibility uh, in re regard to the life force who creates and must create my way out of this distorted world and create a new. So basically, it's beautiful that you're bringing up these issues because I've done lots of teachings for the last 30 years and shared many examples, but initially when we come to the teachings and the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles, there is a reaction for many, uh, like you're having, it's just like, it's like an extreme reaction to, uh, to the teachings. I've had people tell me that they, they basically took the book and they, every day they would tear out a page and crumple it up and throw it in the toilet. Um, people have hurled this book 
uh, across the room, slammed it into uh, the wall, or they, if they're milder, they will just stop reading it and use it as a plant stand or a doorstop uh, for two, three, five, ten years. Uh, they, they let it stay in their house, but they use it as a plant stand. Uh, the, this is like a, a very straight, deep metaphysics. And when you say the word create, um, this is a common word in spirituality, it's in New Age. We talk about, it's a common talk about creativity or the life force creating, or we could talk about with Mother Earth and the planet and so forth. And, and these metaphysics are like getting such a direct, rapid connection into spirit that it's almost like if you if you were drinking a glass of alcohol and it was whiskey or vodka and you to the ego it seems like taking a whole drink of vodka or whiskey uh, that's how it basically reacts to these teachings at first they may seem to be very in, in, so imprisoning that you may doubt you may have serious doubts about them uh, and having studied the Course for half a year, what you're going through is not uncommon at all. Um, these are the reactions, because when the mind is very identified with the ego and the body, that, that even if the spirit is offering something that's so pristine and so super clear and such a direct shot, uh, really a rapid ascension toward the light, that the ego can recoil uh, to some of the ideas. It, it, with just more questions, it will say, what does that even mean? You know, because it's, it's not something actually that can be just intellectually grasped, like some theology, you just read it and memorize it. There's a lot of undoing, there's a lot of clearing, there's a lot of unconscious darkness that comes up in working with the book and working with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. So, I would say uh, one of the things that you'll start to come in contact with is this distinction that has to be made in the mind between that which is created and that which is made or invented. That which is real and that which is fiction. Uh, even in the Bible it said, you know, the things, the things of this world will pass away because they are temporary, but the things of, that are eternal will last forever. And that's the same distinction that is in Corinthians, in the Bible. It's a very deep distinction between the eternal and the temporary. Eternal involves creation. God is eternal. Christ is eternal. You and I, in our true identity as spirit, we're eternal beings. We can't die, that's why it's pure love, because there is no such thing as death. There is no such thing as time increments, or I'll love you for 40 years, you know, that doesn't make any sense in eternity, you know, 40 years is like, what? <laughs> what is that? It doesn't even have any meaning. But in the world of perception, time, and the timeline, that is all part of invention. So what the Course is teaching, in its summary at the very beginning of the book, is nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. That, that is more than a bitter pill for the ego, that is, the ego is like, oh come on, that is just a joke, you know, it's, it, it totally is revolted by the the brief summary of the entire Course in Miracles, it's, it's just at the very introduction and already the revulsion can begin because the ego has made up of its own God. It's made up a God in its own image. It makes up a punishing God. It makes up a fearful God. It, it makes up a, an anthropomorphic God, a God that has feelings, a God that's jealous. The real God is eternal and and is so perfectly innocent and loving that there is nothing in this world that relates 
to God in the slightest way. And yet, when you practice this course, you will start to have insights and discernments and ex mind expansive experiences like Susan Jameson was sharing that will be convincing. Uh, but you're not asked to just take this as a theology or just as another belief system um, that you can read about and, and tell your friends about. You know, this is, this is a deep purification of all the confusion that you've ever experienced in your entire life. This is a, a really a deep healing. And so I would say take it easy, um, be very, very gentle with yourself, and a lot of the, the videos and, and audios and things that I've done over the last 30 years, I use all kinds of examples and I give lots and lots of experiences and, and experiences that I've gone through that helped me build my trust and build my faith. Because that's the most important thing. It's not that you intellectually grasp these ideas. Until your mind's ready, there, there won't be a, a full appreciation of the ideas or, or a transfer. They, they will be held in mind in quite limited ways and just used in just certain situations where it feels safe, where you feel willing and ready. But as you keep giving yourself over to this and as you just open up to the witnesses, you will start to feel the peace and the safety come in and little by little you'll start to develop a confidence in miracles. Because for most of us, we weren't raised in a house, we weren't talking at dinner time about miracles or being a miracle worker or, you know, I was raised in a Christian family but we really never talked about miracles uh, except if they happened 2,000 years ago <laughs> and Jesus did them. Not, if we would never talk about them in our daily lives because frankly we weren't really experiencing miracles in our daily lives and they weren't even our topic of discussion. But for now, for myself and for many of the people that I've worked with, uh, sometimes part of our community, we're experiencing these miraculous states of mind and, and a lot of signs and symbols go with them in our daily life. And so that's why, like Lilo was saying, she, she just wants to talk about miracles and, and Jesus uh, all day long, but she's dealing with is the receptivity of that. Is that, will that be received by my by the ones around me, you know, that's, that's her issue. But I would just say thank you so much for pouring your heart out and for, for joining and attending uh, this weekend retreat and for just exposing and sharing, like here's where I'm at and, and these are just my, uh, my questions and my doubts. So thank you. Well, I think we're winding down here. I'm looking at the, the countdown clock and I, I just have to say that I just feel so much love and gratitude. There, I'm seeing all your faces all over the, the world. They're just flashing across. And I'm, and I'm just so honored and grateful that we're on this journey together because the way that the journey goes, it does require the development of trust. And at the beginning I, I share that like for me it took like a few years of um, I would say maybe like four or five, five years of me just reading the Course and using it as an oracle and receiving answers and feeling my heart open up and then I went through a whole phase of traveling and learning to really listen and follow. And that was just the beginning of the journey. That was just the first uh, decade of, of my journey. And I just want to give you the context that, that every day, if you just have the prayer to be shown to be truly helpful, 
if you can just go forward day by day with that willingness to say, I don't know, but I'm willing to be shown, I'm willing to be convinced. If you just have that willingness and you keep applying that little willingness just day in, day out, day in, day out, the way will open, the way will be shown. And I know for myself, I, f I consider, I was a pretty slow learner and that's why, that's why I can sit here after three decades and, and tell you, just keep the faith. But I do know, what I'm perceiving now is, I'm perceiving like a wave of, of willingness, a wave of openness, a wave of transparency, like nothing I've ever seen before. This, was, this wasn't in my awareness when I picked up A Course in Miracles. I'm looking out and I'm seeing the witnesses to transparency and openness everywhere I look. I'm looking at your faces. There you are. I see you, Peter. I see you, Peter. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. I always have that sweet face looking at me every, every time I come on here. I see the witnesses around me to this willingness. And though the ego may try to throw all kinds of darkness at you, I see it in you. I see it and I feel your willingness. That I'm willing to try this. I'm willing to practice this. I'm not interested in how thick the ego fog is. I've got my torch. <laughs> And I've got my torch right out in front of me and I'm going for it. And if you can just stay with that, just stay with that every day, that will carry you through. Don't try to look far into the future. Don't even ask yourself, how long will it take me to change my mind so completely that I have no speck of ego remaining in it. You know, because Jesus does bring up that question in the, in the Course. He, say, he says, you may wonder how long it will take to so completely change your mind about, about this world. And his answer is, how long is an instant? He, he answers the question with another question. <laughs> How long is an instant? So all he's saying to me is, he's pointing us to this moment. He's saying, right now is what matters. Right now is your opportunity to join with the Holy Spirit, to feel the trust and the optimism of, I will make it. I will make it through. I will heal. I saw that uh, Toward the end of the questions, I saw um, my friend Daniela from down in, um, in Colombia was basically saying, I, I, the fear is, is I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to be able to do this. And, oh yes you are. <laughs> oh yes you are. That's the oldest ego trick in the book. It tries to get you into despair. It tries to get you into sadness and fear. It wants you to bite on the bait of this thought of, I, what if I can make it? I don't know if I can make it. But you definitely are going to make it. Because, why? Because we're joined in this journey together. We are, we are taking each other's hands to stay spirited, to stay lifted up, to stay inspired through anything that comes our way. That's why we, we have Mighty Companion. This is like a, a Mighty Companion network for the Holy Spirit of those that, that are facing the same struggles, trials and tribulations, the same doubt thoughts every day. Even though the form may seem a little different, we're joined as like a, a giant Mighty Companion support group to remind each other, oh yeah, that's the form, and I still have the power of my decision. Because I still have the power of my wanting. So I'm going to close today with that 
song that I was singing earlier. It's like, if you want it, here it is, come and get it. That's, that's Jesus in our mind saying, make your mind up. Give me this moment. Let me show you the power of us joined together. Because when you give me your little willingness and you join your little willingness with the power of the Holy Spirit, that is what ignites the awakening. That is what is unstoppable. And that is what is inevitable to lead the mind to its realization of its destiny. And their ego cannot prevail against a willing mind and the might and the glory of the Holy Spirit. So thank you so much for joining me today and thank you for pouring your hearts out. And we'll take a pause here and then the prayer team will be praying on the best movie <laughs> to be used in the afternoon to, to take everyone up through the portal to the face of Christ, because that's, that's what our prayer is. So thank you all. God bless you and thank you for being here with me. And this is the most joyful way I can think of to, to share time. <laughs> I love it. I'm being with you like this and being in the prayer of our heart in the silence is, is absolutely everything. So thank you.